Welcome to Manifest Online. My name is Brad Hubert. I'm the pastor at Manifest Church. And I was about to record this welcome. And I looked down on my desk here and I saw this jar of vitamin C, which quite frankly, I eat like candy throughout the winter. How many of you do the chewables? Yeah. So then I actually thought, <laughs> I wonder how much stuff I actually use on a daily basis, you know, to just be a normal human, like the things from my medicine cabinet. And I realized, after going through a medicine cabinet, I wouldn't last 11 minutes on Survivor. We just finished a season of Survivor going, yeah, where's my, where's the trip down? So I actually brought everything out of my, my cupboard here to show you kind of what my daily regimen might look like. Uh, I don't take these every single day, all of these, obviously, but just this is like sort of a regular occurrence for me. So again, um, vitamin C to prevent colds and cold effects. You probably do this as well. I don't eat these like candy, by the way. Um, for preventative measures, migraine-wise, I go with niacin and magnesium. My neurologist prescribed these working together. It's kind of like an anti-stroke regimen, I'm told. But if that doesn't work, then it's Tylenol and Aleve. Bam! These, these combine. They work at the problem different ways. I'm kind of pathetic. If that doesn't work, I bring the elephant gun out. And there, this is the risotriptan. Uh, then when it comes to digestion, let's just move on. To a whole different category. I take these pills every single day to help with digestion along with an anti or a antihistamine that kind of helps with certain things. If that doesn't work as a preventative measure, tell me about it, right? This is not a commercial, by the way. It's not meant to be anyways. Uh, brain health, omega-3s, and my adult gummy vitamins. Hello, come on. Uh, I take on a daily basis. Man, it's like I'm a lot of work. <laughs> I'm high maintenance. I don't know if any of you can relate. The older you get, the more things you have in your, can, right? Come on. The older you get, the more things you got to take just to get uh, out of bed every, every morning. But um, I actually started thinking, you know, as we talk today about our security, our sense of security, uh, I wonder if it's just about as complicated for us. Like we, we draw security from all kinds of different places. And yet where should our security come, come from? Like if there was like one kind of source that, that could kind of cover everything, what would that be? Of course, it's something about Jesus because, hey, we're a church, I'm a pastor, I'm gonna point you to Jesus. So let's explore that today. Welcome to Manifest Online. Love you guys, hope you enjoy. Hey Manifest Kids, Mr. Steven here. How was your Christmas? Wow, that's awesome. Well, whatever it was like, wherever you were, whatever you did, I hope that it was full of hope, that it was full of peace, that it was full of love, and that it was full of so much joy. I just wanted to pop in here really quick and say a huge, big thank you to Miss Elizabeth for walking us through this Advent season and helping us learn what each of the Advent candles meant and sharing the stories that she shared with us for each one of those candles on each one of those weeks. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot and really loved those stories. Do you know Miss Elizabeth is a great example for us? We've talked a lot these last couple years about listening, opening up our heart ears and heart eyes to listen and see Jesus. Well, Miss Elizabeth listened to Jesus and Jesus told her what to say. He gave her the stories that she shared with us and it's so awesome, and I am so thank you. So, Miss Elizabeth, on behalf of all of the kids at Manifest, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It was amazing. I also wanted to just pop in here um, to say hi and say stay tuned to find out next year, in January sometime, we'll be back, and I'm gonna share with you, and Miss Shauna will share with you what we're going to do next. On that note, if you guys have any ideas for us, maybe there's a book of the Bible that you have always wanted to read and we could read it together. Or maybe there's a really long passage of scripture, some verses in the Bible that you've wanted to memorize. Or you feel like Jesus asking you to memorize. Maybe we could do that together and take it piece by piece and go week by week to memorize it. Or maybe you have a question and we could talk about it and explore what the answer could be to your question. Whatever it is, if you have an idea, I want you to share it with us. 
if you log on to the Manifest Kids webpage, up at the top right hand corner, there's a button that you can click and it's a ask a question button. You don't have to ask a question. If you have an idea about a book to read, a Bible, a book of the Bible to read, or um, some verses to memorize, or even if you just want to say hi, log on there, let us know. But Nishana and I will be back next year and we'll let you know what we're doing. And I've had a really good year reading through Esther, reading through a bunch of books, and to top it all off with Miss Elizabeth sharing the Advent stories with us. It's been so good, and I really look forward to this time. I love you all. Have a happy new year, and we will see you in 2022. Bye! <music>of this so good series we've been looking at gift ideas for the person who has everything namely gifts that only jesus can provide and and we're we're looking at things like light bulbs in other words how not just how many electricians or or postal workers does it take to change a light bulb but how many light bulbs life-changing epiphanies does it take to change a person and so we've been looking at these epiphanies we've been talking about validation the validation that only Jesus can give us, that no one can take us away, take away from us. The love that Jesus can give us, that no one can take away. So no matter how anyone treats you, you can be okay because you're filled, your love tank is filled by a source that doesn't depend on your circumstances. Isn't that so good? So good. Thank you, Steve. You're, I can tell you're the shirt guy. So take your take your cues from steve he's, he's got it going on today not that i all i don't need shirts from everyone i'm just saying um today we're going to talk about security and uh the the security that only god can give us now i just want to lead with something that's going to offend you can i can i do that <laughs> right away just out of the gate just bam let's get it over with um the, our problem our biggest problem with security and your biggest problem with security probably is that your sense of security is based on how much control you think you have in your life, right? So if things are going well and life is behaving itself, you feel like you're in control and you do fairly well. If life doesn't behave, you feel out of control and you feel insecure. So so our, our tie to security is like this thin thread that gets snipped and cut and pulled and yanked in all kinds of different directions. And what I want to do is I want to challenge that today because, because I want to show you why that's not a good idea to, to kind of base your sense of control on how much control or a sense of peace or security on how much control you have. Because I'm going to show you a list of things you don't control. I'm going to, I'm going to start with something fairly easy I think we can all agree on. Uh, you don't control world events. I, I, I know the butterfly effect says that if a butterfly flaps its wings over here, there's a tsunami in, in Vietnam somewhere or something. Uh, but I, I'm trying to tell you that if you shovel your driveway, it's not going to influence the U.S. election. It's not going to. It's not going to happen. You're, you're out there. You're going. Come on! I, I can't believe the polls aren't being influenced. We we know we can't influence world events. Um, apparently, we found out this week we cannot control the weather. We can't even predict the weather. We can't even describe the weather here in Calgary. We're like, ah, you know, how do we dress? Now, um, this, one, this one can bring a little bit of stress, especially with Notley's plans for us. We, we can't control the price of gasoline, right? And I've had, I've had talks with people in the oil patch, and they talk, they talk about this six-week lag time. I'm like, yeah, it has nothing to do with anything. There's some guy going... <laughs> you know, it's just, I don't know what it is, but we're not controlling it. Um, now, this one, this one's going to hurt a little. This one's going to hurt a little, and some of you are going to disagree with me, I, I think, but you cannot control people. You can't control other people's thoughts, opinions, attitudes, words, or actions. You can influence people's thoughts, actions, attitudes, words. But you can't control, without abusing someone, you cannot control what they do and say and think. And even if you are abusing someone, all you're doing is taking away certain options from them. 
they still have the power to choose. So just, just picture right now the throngs of people, billions of them, billions, like ants, rustling through your life, back and forth, your boss, your, your coworkers, your kids, oh, your kids, just uh, uh, swarming <laughs> everywhere, and you can't control a single one of them. By the way, there'll be a safe space at the back. <laughs> For anyone, if trigger warning, if you're, if you're back there, there will be imaginary puppies, imaginary Play-Doh, and imaginary stuff there for you to relax with, with drinks that are not too hot so you don't burn yourselves back there. <laughs> and if, if you'd like, but honestly, honestly, uh, not there. Um, what, what I'm going to do, though, is uh, out, this one's outcomes. <laughs> you, you can't control outcomes. Did you know that? You can't control a single thing that happens. Nothing. You can influence what happens. You cannot make anything happen. You can strongly encourage it to happen. You can do everything in your power to to make sure that your part of the deal is happening. But you cannot make anything happen. So so we we joke about safe spaces, but we're living in a world where people are feeling out of control and attacked and 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 like we we have to exert or we have to regain some sense of control. And so we have demagogues rising to power saying, I will give you the control back. And we have all kinds of things happening in this world. But what I actually want to do is give you a safe space today that, that doesn't depend on how people treat you. It doesn't depend on retreating from the world and pretending it doesn't exist and and molding Play-Doh. It doesn't depend on anything like that. It is so independent of anything that happens or what anyone says. It's independent of world events and the price of gas and political outcomes. It's completely detached from all of that, which means you can transcend the troubles of this life. That's what I want to give you today. That's the light bulb we're going to talk about. Now, there are some things you can control. Not many. (laughs) <laughs> you can control yourself on a really, really good day. And, and I am telling you, I'm telling you this because on, on most days you can't even control yourself, right? You can't control your mouth, you can't control your temper, can't, you're, you're finding it hard to control yourself. So really, really, we don't have a whole lot of control. So when life doesn't behave itself and we feel threatened and, and we feel the need to re-exert control, really what's just happened is our illusion of control, that little bubble has popped and we're r- scrambling to regain the, and put the illusion back together with whatever we can find because we never were in control. Again, this is a trigger for some of you because some of you are control freaks and every one of us is a control freak to some degree in some area of our lives. And I'm telling you right now, it's best if you just admit you're not in control. All right, so now, this world that we live in, I'm just going to state the obvious. It's a wild, it's crazy, mysterious unpredictable and often even dangerous world and there's not much we can do to influence that even you know, we can do things to influence it but we cannot control it and in your faith or lack of faith has to grapple with that very same issue it really doesn't matter which religion you ascribe to we have to come to grips with the fact that the world is happening and we can't make it happen We're not in control. And it's into this chaotic, dangerous, out-of-control world that God sent his son, Jesus. I love this picture because he looks so vulnerable. He looks so exposed. And he was. Just, Just think about this, okay? So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This is the one shot at at salvation. This is... This is the Hail Mary pass. This is, this is, there's no plan B. It's Jesus or nothing, okay? Your salvation, my salvation, the peace of the world, the whole future of the cosmos literally hangs on this plan of salvation and God decides to put his son into the womb of a teenage girl whom he is hoping remembers to feed the kid instead of checking her phone all day. (laughs) Teenage girl, does this sound safe to you? 
Does this sound secure to you? And then this teenage girl is on a road trip with her husband at the time, who's probably also in his late teens. Oh, teenagers don't even always make good babysitters. And the Son of God is being entrusted. Does this sound safe to you? They're on a road trip, and they're not even home. They can't find a place to stay. God knew that would happen. Does this sound safe to you? And all they can find to put the kid in, baby Jesus, the salvation of the world, is a manger that they had to clear out of what, who knows what. There would have been spiders and cobwebs. There might have been scorpions. There's, there's moldy hay. There's germs. Like, this is not sound safe, right? There, there's, there's animals nearby. There's all kinds of just gross stuff. It probably stinks. It's, it's not a safe place for a baby. Does this sound secure to you? <sighs> He's utterly dependent. The salvation of the world is utterly dependent on this teenage girl getting her junk together and this teenage guy stepping up to do the right thing. <laughs> this is crazy talk. Right? It's crazy. And then he's dependent and he's vulnerable as, they, as he grows up. Now, what, here's what happened. Very soon after this, a king named Herod got wind that this child, this salvation in the flesh had been born. This baby Jesus. There were prophecies and there were magi coming from the east going, we're here to worship the king. And he's like, me? No, other king. Whoa, other king. There ain't no other king. I'm telling you right now, I'm the king. So where is this king? I want to worship him. He gets so insanely jealous that he issues a kill order to kill all the babies in Bethlehem in ages two years and under just to, just to make sure that he just nails it, wipes it out. It's like, right? And, and just, just picture this. So here's this king, by the way, who's in control, he thinks, because he's king, and he's insanely jealous and insecure. Why? Because we're not in control. So he thinks he's got his system lined up, his ducks lined up, and now there's a prophecy and there's stars and there's all kinds of stuff happening that he can't manage, he can't control, and it freaks him out. So what does he do? He tries to regain control through violence. So, so anyways, God, God now he ha doesn't have a problem, but it looks like he's got a problem right now because Herod has issued this kill order. The soldiers are mobilizing. Mary and Joseph are asleep. Little baby Jesus asleep on the hay. And, and they're, 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 they're just, you know, actually they're probably in a home by now. But they're sleeping. They're sleeping. In the middle of the night, these soldiers are mobilizing. They're starting to march. And the salvation of the world is hanging on this. And God decides not to wake Joseph up. No. To give him a dream. And in the dream, an angel comes and says, Herod wants the boy dead. You need to flee to Egypt. So they wake up in the morning. And they go, hey, I had this weird dream. And then now they got to figure out, do you think it was God? It seemed like God. It seemed like it was pretty clear. Like there's an angel in it and stuff. And so they're, they're, they're literally the entire thing's hanging on them going, no, I think this is a God thing. And so they, they decide to get up and they pack up and they, they, they march off as the soldiers are marching, right? Crazy. And then they become refugees in Egypt. Does this sound safe to you? Does this sound secure to you? Does it sound like God views security like we do at all? Right? And, and then, whoa, it's, it's, not, it's even better. Because we read in the book of Revelation what was happening during this entire thing was there's a massive battle in heaven that Satan, in the form of this massive ten-headed dragon, spiritually speaking, was there waiting for Jesus so he could devour him the moment he was born. And there's angels and demons and battles and whatever. Does this sound safe for everything to hang on this? Right? And, and <laughs> this is crazy. Then at, at age 12, they go to the temple as a family for Jesus' bar mitzvah, and they lose the kid. They, they, they walk home. Two days later, they're like, where's Jesus? I thought he was with Uncle Frank. No. Uh, we don't know an Uncle Frank. Oh, dang. So they're like, when they, so they like rush back to the temple. So now he's got like any other kid who have abandonment issues, and Jesus is like, no, nah, it's okay. I was in the temple. I was doing my father's business. And, and then after that, so this is, this is interesting, right? Like if you were plotting this, you're going, um, Mary, salvation of the world, get your butt back there, right? Like, but, but it's like he waits till they figure it out. <laughs> Does not seem safe and secure. Then Jesus, after this encounter at the temple, I don't know if it's because Mary killed Joseph for not remembering, I don't know. But we don't, we don't hear of Joseph anymore in the story. He's gone. He's gone. 
Now, there's no indication that, G- that Joseph was an unfaithful father of any kind. He was a stand-up guy. So probably sometime after Jesus' 12th birthday, he's without a father in this world. So there's, there's this void there as well. As he grows older, he's 30 years old or so, he launches his, his public ministry, Jesus, right? And he calls 12 morons to follow him. We call them disciples. These guys are like backwards. They're just like brain dead. They don't get nothing. They're like, they're slow on the learning curve. And, he's, and the reason he's recruiting these guys is because when he's done his work, it's going to be up to them. Like he's going to entrust the whole thing to them. Not a good plan. Doesn't seem like it to me. Like does not seem safe. Does not seem secure. And then the, every, every turn, it seems like there's demons popping up everywhere through people going, ah! and he's like in the name, you know, get out. And he's dealing with demons because he's constantly being opposed and then there's this, this story that you've probably heard of, or some of you, where Jesus is so wiped out, he's so tired from everything that he's had to go through that day, that, that as they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, a storm comes up, but he's fast asleep. He's like out cold, just, you know, whatever. And the, and the disciples are they're fishermen, a lot of them, and so they're rowing, and the, the boat is in danger of being swamped. And, and finally they look over, and Jesus is like out in the middle of this storm. He's totally at peace. He's totally fine. So they're like, oh, wake up, wake up. And he's like, hey guys, <laughs> what's going on? What's up, what's up? And they're like, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. No, no, we're not. And he calms the storm. And, and you get this picture there of Jesus, even though he can calm the storm, he's sleeping in it before he calms it. So again, his idea of security and safety is way different than you and I would have. Like, what is up with this guy? In fact, that's what his disciples said after that. Weird, right? And then public controversy starts to swell around him. So his entire movement is opposed from every angle. The religious leaders of the day, the church people like you and me, are like, they're, they're like looking down their noses and they're going, that's not what my Bible says. And they're, like going, they're having these debates about Jesus and they're constantly opposing him. They're sending like paparazzi to follow him everywhere to trip him up in what he says so they can get him arrested for blasphemy. And, and, and they're constantly, they, they, I mean, the Russians hacked his email. They're, it's, just, it's just insane. <laughs> right you don't you don't even know what, what he all had to go through and 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 then as he knows his time is ticking because he has like three and a half years to get the ducks lined up in these disciples these morons he's, he's he's trying to get it lined up and very close to the end he's having these moments where he's going they don't get it like they don't even know who i am they, they just think, I, I don't even know, like, right? And so can you imagine, again, the salvation plan for the world that you and I would be the recipients of is hanging on these 12 guys, getting it. They're not getting it. And then near the very end, Jesus is arrested on trumped up charges unjustly. Does this sound safe? His disciples put up a meager resistance with a glorified letter opener and then run for their lives into the shadows just, you know, berating themselves for thinking that they could attack anyone. And Jesus is left to himself, where he is put on trial. These guys come with torches, right? And they they arrest him in the garden. And then he's put on trial, again, with no one there to defend him. And, And there are all kinds of false accusations coming against him. He is savagely beaten to the point where he's unrecognizable. He's whipped until he's just about bleeding out, never mind the cross. And then they throw him on a Roman cross, nailing him to these planks of wood, and gather a crowd to watch him bleed out. Does this sound safe to you? Does this sound secure to you? Does this sound like a good plan to you? And as he's sitting, as, as, he's, as he's hanging there, he's forgiving people. The very people who put him there. And then, can you imagine hanging there? Remember, he's a man. He's God in the flesh, but he's laid his privileges aside. He's hanging there as a man. His entire life's work is nowhere to be seen. If all he was doing was looking at what he could see, all he can see is an angry mob and the world that wants him dead, wants him to go away. They want to sweep him under the carpet. And the only two people who we're aware of that actually showed up were his mom, I think another Mary, and John. 
So his entire life's work, all he's got to show for it is this little clump of people, and he, he's, he's literally feeling his life slip from his body as his last drops of blood are being shed. And all he can do is say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, this mission, everything. I'm yours. And with that, he's dead. Then they take his body down from the tomb or down from the cross and put him into a borrowed tomb. Like you'd think if you're God, you'd plan ahead. Really, like, but this is, he's so, he doesn't have, he doesn't own things. The things that you and I think make us secure. He doesn't even have a tomb. So they, they borrow a tomb, they put him in the tomb, he sits there, lies there for three days. Until early Sunday morning, the power of God comes into him and he sits up and he steps out of the tomb victorious, rises from the dead, and then as he explains what's going on to his disciples who are like, what? Did not see that coming. That is so cool. He's just explaining all this. 40 days later, he ascends. He keeps rising. He ascends to what the Bible says is seated at the right hand of the glory of God, far above all power and rule and authority with death and darkness and sin and pain and suffering and everything beneath his feet. But don't think for a minute that when you said yes to Jesus, you were signing up for a life of what you think is safe. Like when Jesus says, follow me, you do realize what, he, what I just described. <laughs> follow me. See, Jesus doesn't promise safety. He promises security, and not the kind of security that's based on how safe you feel. Not security based on how the world is behaving around you. Not, not security based on how much control you believe you have at any particular moment. Security based somewhere else entirely. I want to ask you, in this moment, if, you're, if there's any more clarity in your life than there's ever been, to lay down what you could call an idol, the idol of the need to control. Your security does not depend on your ability to control your life, to control other people, to control your circumstances. If you want security, you're going to need to look to Jesus for something completely other. So lay that down. You don't have to be in control. If you need to feel like you're in control to have peace, you are destined for anxiety. That is all you will ever get. But if you're willing to lay that down, you can live in an entirely different place. Now Jesus shows us. He shows us how, right in his last breaths. He looks up, instead of out at all the screaming, bloodthirsty people, who he could be trying to gain security from or trying to exert control over. Instead, he lets go of the hell around him and he lifts his gaze to his father and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit and my everything. And I want to show you that even for Jesus in this moment, as a man, but it's for all of us, faith is a choice. We often, we often talk about faith as something you either have or you don't. You're either feeling it or you're not feeling it. And if you're not feeling it, there's not really much you can do about it. But I'm telling you that faith is a choice. And, and I know this because every one of you have faith. Every person in this room has faith. It's just a matter of where you're putting it, you see? So, so some of you are putting your faith in, 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 your, in your retirement package. And some of you are putting your faith in how secure your family feels. And some of you are putting your faith in your job and the fact that you've become indispensable there. Some of you are putting your faith in your ability to knock down barriers in your life. Everybody's got faith. I'm telling you what you need to do, and this is the way that the Bible describes it, the language the Bible uses is to take that faith and put it in Jesus. That's a choice. That's a choice. 
<laughs> Jesus chose to put it in a father who is so all powerful. This is going to blow your mind, I think. He put his faith in a father who is so all powerful that even when his will isn't done, his purposes are accomplished. That's a big thought. Do, do, you, do you understand that when, when we say, oh, I don't have to be in control because God's in control, let me put a massive caveat on that. Because God is not in control in the way we think he's in control or the way we think of control. God is in control, but he never controls anyone. <laughs> So, so God, God's in charge, right? And God, God is in control in the sense that even though you and I do our own thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, even do the opposite of what he's asking us to do sometimes, his purposes still move forward in the earth. That it's way more powerful to be able to accomplish your purpose over time when everyone's running the opposite direction, it takes more power to do that than to actually make us all robots and make us do what he wants. What kind of big God doesn't even need you to cooperate and his purposes on the earth are still going to happen? What? Now, that doesn't mean that every little thing that God wants to happen, happens. You cannot tell me that the children and families perishing in Aleppo, that that is the will of God. That is God's will not happening. Can you, can you agree with that? When, when a homeless person dies in the street 50 feet from a homeless shelter, when they could have been brought inside, that is not the will of God. Right? When, when millions are ba of babies are, are killed year after year after year in the wombs of their mother for convenience, this is not the will of God. Don't tell me it's the will of God. Every day, millions of things that are done in the world, billions of things that are done that contradict the, the will of God, and yet still his purpose is advanced. Look at this. This is for those of you who belong to him. This is the father you're entrusting yourself to. Okay? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. There's this word, who have been called according to his purpose. That does not mean that every little thing in your life, God's going to turn that frown upside down. God's going to turn up the, because then you're going, well, what about this? You forgot this, right? You're going to be like holding him these little, he's like, no, no, no. It's in a bigger sense. His purposes in your life cannot be thwarted because he's that big. He's that awesome. Now, a couple of weeks ago or a month and a half ago, maybe some of you have heard this story. This is a perfect example of this. Uh, it's a Somehow, I don't know how, the, the, the thermostat right in our trailer got cranked up to maximum, and so it baked, like everything inside for like days, 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 baking this thing. And so midweek, I go to open the trailer, this insulated trailer, and the handle's warm on the outside. I'm like, oh no. Open this thing, Noah's in the garage with me, open it up, and there's a smell of like glue and melting rubber, and we're like, oh. So I go to grab stuff out of it, it's too hot to even grab. So Noah and I put gloves on and, and we're pulling stuff out of the trailer. We open up the, the subwoofers. Like these guys down there, they're like, poof, they're steaming in the garage. Like this can't be good. So it, humanly speaking, massive setback. Through this, this whole thing, we lost the soundboard, had to get replaced through insurance. A couple of weeks later, the digital snake went, like thousands of dollars of equipment. Massive setback, right? But in the middle of us unpacking all this stuff, Courtney walks over my driveway and goes, hey, what's up? And we strike up a conversation, right? And through this conversation, I say, hey, we, we're, we've got this church for people that don't like church. He's like, that's perfect for my family, right? So it's awesome. And so they start coming to church. A couple of weeks later, Courtney, and, and now over the last couple of weeks, a bunch of his family's given their life to Jesus. He got baptized last week. This is not a defeat, do you understand? So even though maybe God's will specifically wasn't done in that, his purposes cannot be stopped. Like he just keeps going and going and going. If you hold him to every little, you know, frown to turn upside down in your life, you will lose track and you're going to get so mired down in all the little things. But if you keep track of his purposes in your life and you say, I'm going to trust you, I'm going to choose to put my faith in you, you watch him accomplish that purpose in your life. He will do it. 
He will do it. The, the second thing that we get to do that Jesus accomplished for us, and it, it's, it's kind of building on this last thing I said, is that true security um, puts, here, I'll put it this way, I'll read it for you, comes from, yes, putting our faith in a loving Father so powerful that when his will isn't done, his purposes are still accomplished. But then it also comes from putting our faith or, or living in the victory that Jesus achieved. You remember I, I told you that he ascended, right? And, and he sat down at the right hand of the glory of God, far above all power, rule, and authority. Whoa, yeah. And then if you give your life to Jesus, this is what happened. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. Again, where is Christ sitting? On the throne. Where did God put you? I know it sounds blasphemous, but it's right there. He's, he seated you with Christ on the throne, far above all power, rule, and authority. Do you know what we know? We know about the throne of God from the book of Revelation. We know that around the throne of God, there, there's a sea of glass, clear as crystal, completely unruffled by the, the troubles of earth below. It is completely still. So in other words, God is on his throne and nothing on the earth even makes a ripple in terms of shaking his security, his throne. And Christ has seated you right up there with him. In other words, have you ever felt like when you're in the middle of a struggle, you're, you're, you can't even see straight and you feel like the pressures of the world are on top of you. You feel like your, your, your burdens are weighing you down. They're crushing you. I'm telling you, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're, you're, you're living from the wrong place. Because actually, your prayers aren't bouncing off the ceiling. You're sitting above the ceiling looking down. And that ceiling, that sea of glass, is part of your security now. You can look down through that filter, that clear as crystal filter. You can see now your problems from a different perspective. Like, like if you were just, if you could just right now picture this, okay? So like you're, you're in Jesus, and imagine you're on the throne. I think I've done this before, but like you're like in heaven. You're like, oh. Oh, and there's like rainbows everywhere, which are symbols of God's promise. You're like, this is awesome. And there's like throngs of angels, and there's like gold, and there's a sea of glass. You're like, this is crazy. How awesome is this? And it's, it's a guarantee of what's to come for you, that you're going to end up there one day physically, right? You're going to be there. And so now you look back down at your problem, and you go like... <sighs> That's nothing compared to where I am. And, and now, with this perspective, now you can address your problem in a far different way. See, when we pray from down here in the muck, all you can get is help, help. When you're praying from up here, you go, God, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for your security. Thank you that no matter how this turns out, I'm good. Because my head and my heart are here, but my feet are still down there, and i got to work this out. But thank you for this perspective. Now I have authority, now I've got power, I've got, I've got perspective to deal with my issue in a way I could never have done before. So look at this. This is why Paul, one of the early writers in the Bible, in the, Bible, in the New Testament, said this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. So this is what this means. Set your hearts on things above. Look around. Again, not try to imagine what it's like up there. He's like, no, you're seated with him. Look around. Your heart's desire is here. The presence of God, the power of God, the love of God, it's all there, right? On things above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, and from there, we live. We live. So this is the second one, right? True security doesn't come from being in control. It comes from giving up control to a loving Father so you can live in the victory of His Son. I don't know where you're sitting today. Whether you're sitting, you've, you've, you've envisioned, you've been sitting right in the middle of your problems. You're sitting in it. You're just sitting in the, in the muck of your life. I want to invite you to look up from the hell around you and to say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Knowing that when we give him our spirit, boom, he seats us up there with Christ in heaven 
And now you're not just in your muck. Your, your, your mind, your heart, your energies, your inspiration, it's in a place of unlimited resources and you can look with that perspective on no matter what you're going through. And it doesn't depend, that security there, that doesn't depend on how it turns out down here. So even if hell continues to break loose, like it did for Jesus, it doesn't shake who you are. It doesn't shake where you are. It doesn't shake what you've been given. Can can you imagine, and I'm not saying I live this perfectly, because I don't, believe me, but can you imagine being so firmly anchored in my heart and and your mind, in heaven, those heavenly places, seated with Christ, looking at your problems through that lens, saying, Father, I commit my, my spirit to you, that even though every little thing doesn't work out, your purposes for my life can not be thwarted. Can you imagine the peace that would bring? I don't need to control you then. I don't need to control my circumstances. Now I'm empowered to truly influence them for love's sake, not my own little kingdom's sake. That's good. That is so good. So good. This world, I will lay them at your feet. Surrender every anxious thought for perfect peace. Your perfect peace. All the loved ones I hold dear. All my hopes and dreams and all my fears I will choose to trust your name In everything With everything I will look up For there is none above you I will bow down To tell you
need no other hiding place. I hope is safe within your name. This we know. This we know. You promise never to forsake. What you began, you will sustain. This we know. This we know. of your world this we know this we know and every enemy will be as we declare your victory this we
I hope that was helpful to you. It was fun for me to pull back out of the archives one of the messages I spoke a number of years ago over Christmas, talking about our security in Christ. Uh, man, what great days those were in the gym. We're praying and trusting Jesus for more great days like that to, to come, right? Where we can gather again uh, in person in larger numbers. Won't that be awesome? Uh, for now, I just want to say have a good day. I'm going to pop a couple of these bad boys. Stay ahead of the cold season. Hope you have an amazing day.